Thomas Piketty, you say that an 80% tax rate over incomes of $500,000 wouldn't reduce the growth of the American economy. It's a bit of a leap of faith, isn't it? Oh, maybe it should be above 1 million or above 2 million. But look, I'm not here to make uh, you know, predictions. I'm here to try to put these issues in historical perspective. So what we've had uh, in, in, in the past, you know, it's a very diverse set of uh, experience in terms of tax policy and inequality and growth. So for instance, you know, in America, in the United States of America, on average, uh, the top marginal tax rate between 1930 and 1980 was 82%. Over a 50-year-long period, you know, sometimes it was 90, somewhere it was 70, but if you make the average over this 50-year-long period, this was 82%. Now, uh, this applied above one or two million dollars of annual income, typically, so very high income. And I guess this is the reason why, you know, apparently this is not destroy American capitalism. So, and in fact, if anything, you know, growth rate, productivity growth rate, innovation, uh, as far as it delivers productivity growth rate, was higher before 1980 than it has been since then. So, okay, well, let's go back a little further in. Uh... 1880, there was a 0% income tax. There was no income tax, and economic growth uh, was extremely robust. We had real wages increasing by 48% for industrial workers over a single decade. Uh, and and uh, this is a long-term trend throughout the uh, 7th, the 18th, in 19th century, where taxes were very low, uh, government spending was very low, but the economy was robust and growing. Try to have a quiet debate about these issues. Uh, you know, 80% tax rate would be a disaster if you were to impose it on everybody above 200, uh, above one or two million. Above 200. 200,000 uh, pounds or 200,000 dollars, but you know, above one million or above two million. You know, the historical evidence suggests that, you know, paying a managers 10 million instead of one or 50 instead of 10, you know, it's not that useful. You know, so above a certain point, you know, you just don't see in the data. So there's a few reasons why I don't support uh, soaking high income earners, people making over a million, two million dollars, putting their marginal tax rate at 80%. Uh, the first reason is it's wrong, it's unjust. Uh, that that wealth was created by them and and they deserve it and it's wrong for the state to to threaten them with violence in order to get their money uh it's true of all taxation taxation is theft taxation is immoral uh, but uh, it's it's also true of this case um also i don't think it's a good idea from a utilitarian perspective what's the the government going to spend that money on there's a real moral hazard with any sort of government spending because the money is collected through coercion. So that means uh, it doesn't matter what it's being spent on, you have no choice, right? So as opposed to, you know, if Greenpeace comes to my door and they ask for some money, I can choose whether or not I want to support them. Uh, when I go to a, a mall, uh, and I buy something, I'm choosing to, to purchase that item. But with government spending, uh, the, the people who are paying the bill don't have the choice. The choice is made by politicians. And this is why you end up spending money with government on things like blowing up poor, innocent brown children in the third world. You know, the most horrible, heinous thing you could possibly do the government does for political reasons. This is why you have uh, nonsense economic policies like uh, paying farmers to kill pigs, which is one of the things they did during the Great Depression uh, because they thought that the problem was too much supply. It wasn't too much supply. The problem was prices were kept artificially high, uh, whereas if they had just been allowed to go to the, the uh, equilibrium rate the market clearing price then then you wouldn't have had the so-called glide uh so so there's a lot of government programs that are uh not just a waste of money but in fact directly counterproductive a destruction of money and destruction of wealth so i'd much rather 
that money be in the hands of a super rich person. Another thing is that people with high incomes are much better positioned to save uh, more of their income because they're already, you know, if you're making two million a year, you're, you're probably already got your consumptive spending under control. <laughs> some some people know, you know the, <laughs> but uh, but for most uh, people or for a lot of them, I'd imagine. So so if it, it comes down to you know them paying another two hundred thousand in taxes or them having that two hundred thousand then uh, probably a high amount of that will be saved and invested. And that's where long-term economic growth comes from, from, from savings. Because what happens is that savings gets reinvested into additional capital, into man-made factories of production like factories. And, and that's where real long-term economic growth comes from, not from uh, consumption, which is this idea pushed by the media and establishment economists that uh, you know you got a, a, a frenzy of consumption and then and then the velocity of the money is going to increase and and that's going to somehow create more wealth when when in reality the velocity of the money doesn't matter money is just a medium of exchange and it is always sufficient for the purposes of exchanging production which is really what the economy is all about. the extra managerial performance that you would like to see. He's not talking about whacking the rich, he's just talking about whacking the super rich. What's wrong with that? Well, there's lots of economic evidence and lots of counter-economic evidence, actually, that um, high rates of high marginal tax rates on, on high earners actually has a negative effect on growth. I know that some of your work suggests otherwise, but other, many other people have done work on this. I'd suggest... Sorry, sorry can, I just, can I just finish this point? I'd suggest it. that if you look at the history of the UK, for example, we had extraordinarily high tax rates in the 1970s, up to 98%. We still do have really high marginal tax rates. ...percent on unearned capital income. That time wasn't a, a sort of productive egalitarian paradise in the UK. In fact, it was associated with the period of worst industrial relations that we've had um, uh, in the 20... And that's true. Uh, really high tax rates lead to a slowdown of capital accumulation because uh, people can't, can't save as much money. Century. The FT has said that some of your numbers have been constructed out of thin air. Uh, this is wrong. You know, I have responded to that, you know, point by point. You know, look, I'm, I put all the data online. Everything can be reproduced, including the formula, all the computer do files. And, you know, we, we put updated uh, data online almost every week, you know, on the World Top Income Database website. So, you know, I am very happy that, you know, this book is stimulating. French people sound funny. ...debate, you know, this is what it is here for. And, and uh, you know, I think in the case of the FT, I think they are wrong. You know, I think they, they should not deny uh, that, you know, inequality, uh, you know, has been rising. And but, I, but I there, think that, they, that, they, it's not just they, the FT. It's not just the FT. It's the Office for National Statistics, our main statistical body. And I spoke to them uh, last week, and they're very confident about their figures, actually. They think their survey data is extremely reliable. The, the um, and, and I understand, I understand they that they're doing some the work. Of, the, of their wealth survey data? That's what they suggested to me. About the top part? That's what they suggested to me. No, look, this is self-reported data where the top is entirely missing. You, know, you don't have a, any anybody above one or two million uh, pounds, but, and but, you have nobody at 100 million pounds. So, of course, you know, if you have a wealth survey where the top is excluded from the survey, so you're saying you, there are people with 100 Thomas, million pounds okay. in you, the you, wealth you survey? You use self-reported data for the United okay. States, Well, you know? no, but this wait, wait. was compared with... No, no, but look, that's a very important point. The survey of consumer finance that's organized by the Federal Reserve in the United States, you know, they compare the findings and they upgrade the top part on the basis of administrative tax data on large net returns and on the basis of rankings of large fortunes made by magazines. As, as far as I know, the ONS is extremely important. This is extremely important, though, because if, if, if the ONS is right, and if you look back at no. some of the other historical sources, it actually suggests that, OK, wealth inequality may have gone up a bit in the UK over the past 40 years, but it's not this huge sort of oh, extrapolation. I think it's irrelevant. What does it matter if wealth inequality has increased or decreased? What does it matter if income inequality has increased or decreased? The question isn't uh, how are people doing in relative terms, but how is uh, the working class and, and lower income workers, people that are working, you know, the lowest paying jobs, 
How are they doing in absolute terms? That's the, the most, most important uh, question. The other thing is, when, when you look at these statistical groupings of the top 10%, the top 20%, the bottom 20%, you're looking at statistical groupings, not real flesh and blood uh, human beings, as Thomas Sowell says uh, in his book, um, Shepherd One, the one I read. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so, so the point is, people leave these statistical groupings. Somebody can be in the bottom 20% of income earners one year, five years later, they might be in, you know, the middle or the top income earners. Uh, that's especially true of retirees. Uh, so, so, uh, a better question too is how is social mobility doing? You know, are, are people able to leave these lower income groups, you know, if they have the drive, the ambition, um, if you if you're just looking at you know the top eighty percent, the bottom twenty percent, I don't think that's going to tell you a lot of really important information. No, but let me say why is that it so I agree. hard to measure the wealth of the very rich? Why is that so difficult to do? Well, because they tend to hide. You know, they don't want to 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 report it to a survey. But let, let me say that I agree with what you just said, which is that there's been only a limited rise in wealth inequality in across Europe, and that it's only in the United States that you know the rise in wealth concentration has been really large. We can argue about the extent of wealth inequality, but you'd admit, would you, that it matters? Um, it, depend, it depends, actually. And actually, I think one of the weaknesses of, of Thomas's book, which I think is a very interesting contribution to the debate, is that Barr sort of saying, oh, there's democratic implications, didn't really spell out why wealth inequality was necessarily a bad thing. And I actually think this is all a bit of a, a sideshow. If you look back at the history of the past 200 years, since we've sort of rolled out capitalist systems across the world, we've seen the most extraordinary improvement in the absolute living standards of, course, of yeah. people all across the world. And we're seeing this in, in, in China and India at the moment. And global inequality, if you, if you take that measure, is actually falling. So I think we can get wrapped up in this very static look at the distribution of wealth or the okay, distribution wealth, of income at any one but time. But wealth inequality feels pretty rough if you're at the bottom of the... But, but there is an issue where... Um, Real wages across the board are still increasing, but real wages, especially for lower income earners, are probably not increasing as fast as they could be, and certainly are not increasing as rapidly as they did in the past, specifically the 19th century during the Gilded Age, when we had a gold standard, um, when the economy was first industrializing, laissez-faire uh, economics was being practiced, Government spending was was about four percent of the economy, and and workers' wages were skyrocketing because uh, you had the perfect economic system in place. There's very little little taxes, very little regulation. All of the wealth was just getting reinvested back in the economy, and uh, and you had a ton of immigration, which uh, especially combined with the economic model at the time. Uh, they had was was a positive engine for growth. They had uh, they had a very non-interventionist foreign policy, and they had sound money. Uh, you can't underestimate the value of sound money. A real gold standard. No central bank. Uh, the Federal Reserve wasn't founded until 1912, and at that time you had a true gold standard, and so there was. Uh, uh, steady economic prosperity, extremely high growth, and and that's what we need to get back to. But the problem is today we have extremely high tax rates, so a lot of the wealth that's being produced the pile, is, then, isn't it? is then being consumed by the political class instead of being reinvested in the economy and uh, contributing to economic growth. That's poverty. They, you know, poverty feels very rough. I don't think inequality feels very rough per se. I mean, what's the causal mechanism by which inequality per se leads to um, uh, poorer living standards? I mean, that's poverty. That's yeah. not inequality. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think most people in the UK, most people in the UK, think that when they've earned 
uh, well, earned their income and earned wealth, it should be theirs. I think if you look at the inheritance tax, for example, 70% of people in the UK think the inheritance tax is wrong on principle. And that's well, why Margaret Thatcher was so successful. Let me put this to you, though. You've got a book on actually. capitalism storming up the bestsellers charts. Mm. Um, suggests a fundamental crisis in capitalism. Can it survive? Um, well, I think it can survive because I think it's the only show in town. Look, the, the book was really split into three parts as far as I can see. First, it's a very useful contribution on the history of inequality of income and wealth, which I think is a fantastic work. Um, the second part was on a sort of forecast of, of what would happen you know, uh, based on certain assumptions, which you know some of them are qu more questionable than others, assumptions about growth, assumptions about how much the wealthy save, about transmission of inheritances, and the third was the um, the policy recommendations. I actually think when this debate's all over, the second two won't be remembered as much as the contribution of the first. Uh, you were in Parliament yesterday. I think you saw Ed Miliband among other people. Is he the man to translate your ideas into action? Do you think? Look, I'm not going to take position. You know, on the, on the UK <laughs> he's taken a position on you though. Debate. <laughs> Yeah, you know, again, I think these issues are beyond left and right. You know, we, we talk a lot with Ed Miliband about this mentioned tax issue. And, you know, as I told you before, you know, to some extent, this is a joint labor and conservative uh, product. And, and, you know, I think both parties should be uh, concerned about making it work okay. in a more efficient Did manner. And again, annual... Did you meet property the Tories tax, yesterday? Annual property tax. Uh, I, I don't think they invited me, but you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a very polite person, and I usually respond to, to invitation. But Ed Miliband's most, impressed most, you, has he? Most of the time. Yeah, you know, I think he's concerned about a situation where you know it's more and more difficult for people who start with only their labor income and no inherited wealth, you know, to accessing wealth and start accumulating wealth. And one of the great things about America is. Uh, historically, the, the the prevalence of the Horatio Alger stories, people that, that come to America uh, with nothing, just a shirt off their back, and end up amassing great fortunes. Um, now, now, probably that's not as easy today as it once was, precisely because you have too much government intervention in the economy. You've got regulations that make it more difficult for small businesses to compete because of the imposition of high fixed costs. You have uh, uh, um, regulatory barriers to entry into markets and trades. Um, you know, ultimately, what I care about, you know, is the diffusion of wealth. You know, it's not the fact that we have uh, large quantities of wealth relative that's that's not a goal I share, uh, the diffusion of wealth. I think it's important to consider justice. So wealth is created, and I don't see why it would be considered just to have the state redistribute that wealth using coercion uh, so that the wealth went from those who created it to those who did not. I see it as just when somebody creates wealth and they get to keep it. For example, if you have an artist and they sculpt a, a, a sculpture out of clay, who should it belong to? There's only three options. Should it belong to all men equally? Should it belong to a select group to determine what happens to it? Or should it belong to the artist himself? And I think most people agree that it should belong to the artist. He's the creator, he created it. Now, production in an industrial economy is a lot more complicated, but ultimately uh, it's the same thing. Everybody's paying, playing their part. You know, uh, the worker contributes their labor, the businessman contributes their investment, their, their expertise, they take the risk. Uh, they put the money up front and, uh, and at the end of the day, in a market economy, people tend to get paid relative to their contribu contribution to the productive process. So there's a great justice in that. And and I don't think that that uh, equality of wealth is necessarily an ideal we need to aim towards. To GDP is certainly not bad per se, but we want that everybody has a chance, you know, to access uh, property. You know, right now, uh, when you have a large mortgage, 
and sometimes some people have mortgage cards that can be you know even larger than their property value but you keep paying you know the same property tax in most countries or the same council tax in this country than someone without a mortgage and was inherited from his house or was finished reimbursing the house 30 years ago i think that's wrong you know i think if we want to help newcomers <coughs> to start accumulating wealth people who start from zero we need to have a more balanced uh, yeah. tax system taxing labor income less Yep. and taxing large accumulated wealth a bit more because, you know, you are... I'm all for taxing labor income less. Uh, absolutely, you know, raise the, the minimum exemption, uh, decrease marginal tax rates for any bracket. I'm on board with that. I'm not on board with raising taxes for anybody. You have to make sure... Okay. Thing. Thomas Piketty, Ryan Bourne, thank you very much right. for joining me. She's a rep.